Good evening, everybody. Um, this is one of the last events at this year's 10th, no, sorry, 9th Cheltenham Science Festival. My name's uh, Jill Samuels, and as some of you may know, I'm the outgoing chair of the festival. And it's a delight to have such a full house at, uh, at this hour of the day on a Sunday. So I take that as a, a mark of enthusiasm for our two speakers, if not for the topic of sleep. Um, you'll see that you've, uh, so no loud snoring, please, if that's the problem. Um, you'll see, or you've all been given questionnaires on the way in. Do take time to fill them in because they're part of the presentation, as it were, as I understand it. Is that correct? Hand signals will do at this stage, gentlemen. Very good. So, um, it must puzzle you, it certainly puzzled me why I've got mates who, you know, get by on three or four hours a night, and if I don't have my regular eight hours three or three times a week, I'm, I'm lost, basically. Uh, and some people can fall asleep anywhere, and I've noticed that as I get older, that's a common problem. Um, but some people need, you know, total science and pitch black. Um, do two hours before midnight count for much more afterwards? So we're going to have a great evening this evening because we've got uh, a scientist, and that seems logical to talk about sleep, Russell Foster, who is uh, the professor of circadian neuroscience and head of the Nuffield Laboratory of Ophthalmology at the University of Oxford, and also is a fellow of the Royal Society, um, which is a very distinguished position. And, and um, he's now risen to the dizzy heights of being the next chair of the Cheltenham Science Festival. Now, of course, it's, it's understandable why Russell is on the stage, but it might be less understandable to those of you who came last year that we have an economist on the stage. So I'm delighted to welcome also Evan Davis. Uh, actually, it says former economist. No, no. Former economist at the Institute of Fiscal Studies and a graduate of both Oxford University and Harvard. He's one of uh, the British media's most revered communication communicators on business affairs in recent years. So, gentlemen, you have the stage. Thank you very much, Jill. Well, of course, I'm also a presenter of a morning radio programme on Radio 4. Uh, and I started that two years ago and have never thought more about sleep in my life. <laughs> and... Um, uh, my, my schedule on the night, two or three nights a week when I'm working, is to get up at ten past three, which is not an early morning, it's the middle of the bloody night, believe me. <laughs> um, now, the BBC, it's not much of an exaggeration to say, give us a lot of advice on how to do all sorts of things, and healthy, health and safety advice in particular. Uh, there are manuals, virtually, I'm not joking, telling you how to walk across an office, um, lest something goes wrong. Uh, the BBC give you no advice at all on managing sleep or coping with sleep or how to, uh, to sort of make sure that you are awake at the time <laughs> you're meant to be on air. It has fascinated me. I have my own strategies for dealing with it. I'm not suggesting sleep is a problem. I think I enjoy my sleep more than I ever have before. But a year ago, I was at the festival talking about economics, and I said, you should do something on sleep. Uh, it's a really good topic. Um, and what we've got is that very, that very the, the, the answer to that uh, suggestion. So what we're going to do is we're going to listen to Russell for about a little under 10 minutes, who's going to just give us the basic theory. Uh, we'll have some chit-chat up here. We'll talk about the questionnaires, which hopefully most of you will have done, which are pretty straightforward. Um, a little more chit-chat up here, and then we'll have uh, a bit of time for some uh, questions and comments from the floor. But let's start. Russell. Thanks a so theory well. lesson in sleep. And all right. Yeah. OK. Thank you. So first of all, I'd just like to thank the Oxford Biomedical Research Centre for supporting uh, this presentation. Let's start with the nuts and bolts. Um, many of you, I think, will know that we have an internal representation of time. We have a body clock, um, which is located uh, deep down in the brain. This is the optic chiasm. If you can imagine, when the optic nerves go into the brain, they fuse. And just either side, there are these suprachiasmatic nuclei. If that region of the brain is destroyed, 
then our 24-hour rhythms of hormone release, of behavior, are completely abolished. And it's in a remarkable bit of the brain. You can actually take this bit of the brain out in an animal, and you'll see 24-hour oscillations of electrical activity in the whole slice, and you can take an individual SCN neuron, and you can still get 24-hour oscillations. And what that tells us, of course, is that the way that this clock is generated is subcellular. There are genes which give rise to proteins. Those proteins then form part of a complex, uh, a complex which then drives this 24-hour oscillation. But the critical thing to appreciate is that sleep, as illustrated by the sleep-wake cycle here, is more than just this body clock, which you'll be familiar with. What the clock does is tell the brain, effectively, now is the appropriate time to sleep, and now is the appropriate time to be awake. But there's lots of other interactions. The other key driver, and, and it's perhaps the intuitive part about sleep, is what's called the hourglass or homeostat. The longer you've been awake, the greater the need for sleep. The sleep pressure builds up. And so these two oscillators essentially time and regulate the timing and the duration of sleep. But there's more than that. Some of you may be familiar with a structure called the pineal. It sits in the middle of the brain. Descartes thought it was the, 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 um, the location of the soul. Not, of course. Um, produces pineal melatonin. And melatonin feeds back on this master clock here and, and gives a biological representation of the dark. Melatonin is released at night. And it also probably has a direct sleep-inducing effect on the structures in the brain that are driving the sleep-wake cycle. We also have to add in light. Light is critically important. Light will, or the light-dark cycle, will set the clock to local time. Classic mismatch between biological time and environmental time is jet lag. The reason you get over jet lag when you fly to New York or somewhere is largely as a result of this mechanism here. Light will actually uh, inhibit melatonin production. So it takes away that, that hormonal representation of the dark. And of course, light will have an alerting effect. Now you're feeling tired, you're nodding off to sleep because we're in a dim, dim, dark room. If I were to turn the lights up, you'd feel completely energized. And these are really important mechanisms. And then, of course, finally, we have the alarm clock. Most of you, I fear, would have been wakened by an alarm clock. And so what we've got in the sleep-wake cycle are lots of different interacting components. And distort any one of them and you can have sleep problems. And really part of the discussion this evening will be how all of these various component parts all work together to get beautifully consolidated sleep. Now, when things start to go wrong, let's say, as Evan has to do, he has to get up at 3.30 at in the morning, you're forcing the sleep-wake cycle, which then, of course, ripples through and distorts the rest of you know, abnormal light exposure. Um, it's going to feed back on the homeostat. Uh, all of this will be distorted. And distortion of these components gives rise to sleep disruption. And we see di sleep disruption in many activities that we now currently indulge in in, in our society. Shift work, 20% of the working population are working out of hours. 24-7 lifestyles. It's been estimated that on average we're sleeping one and a half to two hours less every day than we were in the 1950s. We are frequently described as a chronically sleep-deprived society. Age, the nature of, of, of sleep will change with age. Chronotype, whether you're a morning person and an evening person, and, and that's the questionnaire that you will have filled out. And indeed, your chronotype is to some extent, but not exclusively, dependent upon those genes which are regulating that 24-hour oscillation. Tiny changes in some of those genes have been associated with morning people and evening people. Then we go on poor sleep, he, uh, poor sleep hygiene. And we'll touch on this uh, at the end. I have to say there's some pretty dodgy practices going on in British bedrooms, and, and we'll touch on that <laughs> in a moment. Jet lag, um, obvious space. Um, talking to the NASA engineers, they said, we can build you a craft that will get you to Mars and back, but you c can you tell us what the biological environment should be? So there's a lot of interest by NASA in this. And then finally, neurological disease. Many conditions, mental health states and neurodegeneration are associated with abnormal sleep. Let's just touch on this shift work and these 24-7 24 lifestyles and look at some of the pathologies, genuine, well-documented pathologies that have been associated with this disruption. And here's a list of them. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I will just like to touch on one or two. 
drowsiness, microsleeps, unintended sleep. This is a study from a nuclear power plant, and I, I couldn't resist the, the, the Homer Simpson here. 60% of the workers admitted falling asleep once a week. This is in a nuclear power plant in the middle of the night shift. 25% of the workers fall asleep four to five times a week. 15 fall asleep about 10 times a week. 33% of the workers admitted that falling asleep had caused a significant error or near miss once a year. And one of the most chilling components of this study was that all five of the controllers um, of this nuclear power plant had fallen asleep in the middle of the night shift. And the researchers, and they woke themselves up, the researchers had again on, got, uh, spoken to them and said, were you aware you'd just fallen asleep? And they said, well, of course, that was so bloody stupid. I was only in Swedish, which is where this study was done. Um, said, I'm perfectly fine. And, and that's the most dangerous thing, because you're incapacitated, but you don't know you're incapacitated. What about metabolic problems, weight gain, weight loss? Some very interesting data emerging from the United States suggesting that sleep loss is related to an increase in the hormone called ghrelin. Ghrelin is the uh, appetite hormone. It increases appetite um, and promotes hunger and particularly the consumption of carbohydrates. And what you find, particularly in night shift wor workers, is a tendency towards obesity, um, and some of that is, seems to be driven by the sleep loss associated with the release of, of ghrelin, the, the, the hunger hormone. And correspondingly, leptin, the satiation hormone, tends to go down with sufficient sleep. So there's this, this seesaw of, of ghrelin and, and, and leptin, which are regulating appetite, goes very badly awry in sleep regulation. Decreased cognitive performance, ability to concentrate and remember, reduced communication and decision skills, all the sorts of things that Evan needs desperately at uh, 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 6 o'clock in the morning. And let's, let's imagine what his brain might be like. This, is, uh, this isn't Evan's brain, it's true. It's, it's another subject who has a fully rested, uh, uh, got enough sleep, and they're performing mathematical tasks. And this is, a, this is a functional imaging scan. You see all these lovely areas of the brain all lighting up. Let's now sleep deprive this individual and ask them to do a similar set of tasks and you see not a lot of activity. It's a little bit of, of activity there. It's a really profound illustration of the importance of sleep in brain function. And the real problem is that brains like that indulge in stimulant and sedative use. Tired brains are woken up in the morning by an alarm clock. And the second thing that the brain will instruct the body to do, probably, is to grab a cup of coffee, coffee. And if it's a really naughty brain, it'll go for some ciggies. Because nicotine and caffeine are very effective at fueling the awake state. And much of the awake state during the day is fueled by these stimulants. And then, of course, towards the end of the day, thinking... And much of the awake state during the day is fueled by these stimulants. And then, of course towards the end of the day, thinking, I need to go to sleep. I've got to get up early the next day. But yet, there's large uh, amounts of these stimulants still circulating in the body. The tendency then is to take alcohol or sleeping uh, uh, substances, and they will induce sleep. But they are not a biological mimic for sleep. And in fact, alcohol and sedatives will actually um, reduce aspects of brain activity, which are critical for memory consolidation and, and part of the brain processing that goes on while we're asleep. You wake up by the alarm clock even more tired, more stimulants, more sedatives, and, and, it's, and it's, this is um, the loop that many of us, unfortunately, are locked into in um, our 24-7 society. Give you some sense. After oil, coffee beans are the highest, and Evan will correct me on this if I'm wrong, coffee beans are the highest traded commodity on the open market, to give you some sense of our absolute fiendish desire for caffeine. So hopefully that's given you some idea of what it's like to be sleep deprived. <clears throat> Evan. Thank you very much, Russell. Just two, two quick things. Why are you in a department for ophthalmology? <laughs> well, you, um, this is another lecture. But, but why, I'm, uh, why I'm in uh, running the ophthalmology is because the eye is doing two fundamentally different things. It's grabbing light, of course, to make an image. And you're using sp you know, your rod and cone receptors to look at me and, and form an image. But there's another set of receptors in the eye which have nothing to do with image formation but are detecting the overall amount of light in the environment. This is a new class of receptor that we've discovered. And it's the one sending the message in to the suprachiasmatic nuclei to set the clock to local time. So you can be visually blind, but not clock blind. 
And one of the things that I'm really passionate about and why I wanted the job was because we can now start to tell the ophthalmologists what it will be like, you know, obviously if you've got a disease, what it would be like to be visually blind, but also the impact of your sleep and, and your sleep timing systems, which is largely ignored at the moment Very in, in, in uh, health. Now, you've given us a little outline of the theory there. Do we know more or less everything we want to know about sleep, or is this some great dark area of science in which we're just feeling our way at the very beginning? It has been up until fairly recently, and what's so fascinating about sleep is that we know it draws from, unlike the, uh, the suprachiasmatic nuclei, which is, a, which is one of the great goals in neuroscience, is to associate specific structures in the brain with a specific function. Sleep is distributed broadly throughout the brain. There are nuclei in the brainstem, all through the hypothalamus, and indeed in the thalamus, and even in the cortex, which are all interacting. There's about five, six, seven neurotransmitters involved in sleep, maybe more. And so it's very complicated. Distort any one of those neurotransmitter systems and it will feed back on sleep, then distort aspects of physiology that we've talked about. Right. Now, you mentioned that one of the important things is the kind of the person we are, really. I mean, I mean what was the phrase, the word you the, used? The, the chronotype. The chronotype. The yeah. chronotype. Um, you've got everybody, or we've got... Uh, how many of you have actually had a chance to, uh, to do the questionnaire so far? So the vast bulk of you have done it. Okay, so we don't really need to spend very long giving them the instructions on how to do it. You were bright enough to work out <laughs> how to do it anyway. Um, if we can turn the house lights up, we're just going to do a quick show of hands on what the, uh, on what the, um, the types have got Does, there, does up. anybody else need a few seconds do, to finish? Do you want, do, how many people, do, do few people need a few little seconds to, um, to fill it done. out? Fantastic. Okay, so we, we basically got it. We basically got it. Right. So you've totted up your scores. You've got the, uh, the results. Let me just call up here. We've got the... Um, where are we? Yeah. So uh, just go through these. That's the questionnaire. And then you do all of that. And this, this is telling you how to do the questionnaire. Right, go. so those are the categories you uh, come into. Now, how many of you came into the intermediate category? Right, so probably about half. I came into the intermediate category too. How many of you were one of the two morning categories? Ooh. Oh, God. That's <laughs> amazing. You're our <laughs> listeners. And uh, how, many of you, how many of you were definitely morning? How many of you were definitely morning? Oh, so we've got quite a lot of definitely morning. That's, That's more than good. you thought, isn't it? That's Lord? a little more than I would have thought, yes. Right. Yeah. How many of you were uh, evening of one of the two types of evening people? So we had more mornings, right? More morning okay. people. Right. And how many of you were definitely evening? Not very... That's... Good gracious. So very... Really, that's interesting because actually... Huh. Well, probably the evening people are getting out of bed and just thinking about what, uh, <laughs> what nightclub to go to. Because you would normally have thought that was going to be what? Um, I would have thought a, a more normal distribution. And in fact, there so is... This is, this is what you thought. Yeah, that's, that's thought. the sort of thing I would have, I would have thought. And, I'd have, and I've anticipated that there have been almost equal numbers of, of, of extreme definitely morning and definitely evening. Now, why that ratio might change is because of age. Now... The young people <laughs> tend to be <laughs> definitely evening types. I so know I where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd have some sense that this is, a, this is a, indeed a biased audience um, <laughs> towards more elderly rather than, than young. Um. <laughs> so it does change with age, though. And it the teens are sort of tends to be at the extreme end of the, uh, the right-hand side. They tend to be evening uh, to definitely right. evening. Yeah. Okay, now a couple of follow-up questions. Did, did we have any couples here who had opposite, um, out of interest... Opposites. Yes, we've got a couple down here. Let's let's just get the microphone to these two and just see whether they. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Have we got a mic? mic? Yeah, sir. Can you just uh, take? Me? Did did you know that you were opposite to? Uh... I think you can just talk into it. It'll be fine. Um, yes. Yes. Definitely <laughs> new opposites. Which are you out of interest? Um, I, I'm more later on in the day. Right. So you have to kick him out of bed in the morning. Yes, I'm definitely a morning person. Yeah. And how I does that? Turn in about eleven or twelve at night. So. Uh, right. So how does that work in couples? Um, Russell, well, the... you'll be very pleased to know that um, there's some good data on this. The longest lasting marriages are between morning types and evening types. Um, <laughs> And, and maybe the cynic would was explain that, of course, is that you don't see much of each other. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that's a little yeah. harsh. <laughs> right. Morning types. 
How many, put your hands up, morning types, again, if you're one of the two mornings. How many of you find work slightly gets in the way of your, of your, of your sleep habits and days? So really very, very few, yeah. which is what you'd expect. Exactly what you predict. Because actually yeah. getting up is okay. Evening types, put your hands up. And how many of you find work is a sort of, slightly gets in the way of your... Yeah. None of the hands so have basically, gone down. So exactly. basically the hands yes. will stay up. So, so even mm. Right, so morning types, hands up again. How many of you find the sort of social life sometimes is a bit annoying because you want to go to bed and you're... Yeah, yeah so it's, 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 it's absolutely... But whereas evening types, I imagine... Evening types, hands up. Is social life ever a problem? No, no, it's, no, not. It's amazing. It, it so, 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 so there's a real pattern. Yes, I mean, the late types, of course, do find it getting up you know, getting to work, uh, a problem. The, evening, the, the morning types that you think, fantastic for work, there's huge social pressure of staying up and partying. Um, and, 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 of course, it can make you sleep deprived at the other end of the scale. Yes. I mean, that is all very interesting. Can, can a person change their chronotype? It's pretty tricky. Um, the, the, the basic chronotype, as we were discussing, will change with age, and that's probably due to changing steroid levels, um, th th steroid levels through, through puberty. And there is this tendency from the age of 10 to get a bit later and later and later. Males tend to get later for longer. And after the age of 21, 22, they begin to want to go to bed earlier again. Women, again, get later and later, up to about 19, and then they turn. By the age of 55... Men and women are getting up and going to bed at about the same time. So that's a joyous point to, to look forward to during a relationship. I mean, uh, but, but men tend to, get, to go to bed later for longer than women. Right, right. And what should people do about it? I mean, I was an intermediate person, and I'm getting up very early. So, but, but what would be the advice if you are... And actually, some companies are using this questionnaire, aren't they, to decide who should be on which shift, in yeah. fact, aren't they? I, in fact, I didn't answer fully your, your question. The, the other thing, there is this change with age, but, but we're now finding that particular genes, these clock genes, are associated with subtle changes that, that tend to be found more frequently in morning types versus evening types. So there is a, there's a profound genetic right. contribution to this. And there's a, there's a car plant in southern Germany, in Bavaria, which is chronotyping the workforce and basically saying, look, you're a morning type, you're an evening type, would you like to basically work on the appropriate shift? And productivity seems to go up under those circumstances. And more important, uh, 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 the accident level in the night shift has actually gone down. So, so matching chronotype to your work demands can be very, very useful. Yeah, that, that is actually absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Um, and then the other question was what you can do about it. I mean, I suppose I was an evening person, I was by dint of... Uh, job opportunities, working in a morning job. I mean, what, what should I do? There is the tendency, of course, to lapse into bad ways. I mean, the, the, the use of sedatives and alcohol to try and induce sleep and then stimulants during the day. And actually, that is a very bad uh, idea because you get caught up in a really quite dangerous spiral. And, and, and really, what do you do? It's, it's very tr tricky working against your body clock. You can try and shift, and, and indeed you can use the light-dark cycle to drive you backwards and forwards through time, but it's very inhibiting. Essentially what you'd have to do is, is impose a light-dark cycle and then not see any natural light. I mean, the really interesting thing is why don't night shift workers shift their clocks to the demands of working at night? And they don't. After 20 years on the night shift, the body clock doesn't shift. And that's because it's locked on to the same light-dark cycle that everybody else is. It's relatively dim light in the office or in the factory. Bright light during the day, the clock defers to the bright light. Now, what you can do is increase the light in the factory, hide people from light during the day, and you will switch. But not unreasonably, people really object to not being allowed to go outside <laughs> and being forced to wear dark glasses during the day. But there must be some interesting research you can do in the northern this far north, where they, they get no night for half the year and no day for half the year. Yeah. And, uh, and, and what's so fascinating is that there's, there's this, this condition called seasonal affective disorder, which has been associated with this lack of light. What's fascinating is that in the European populations that have moved into the north, um, Tromso, for example, 27% of the population has been associated with having some form of seasonal affective uh, d disorder, whereas the Inuit, um, almost unheard of. So there's, there's some important selection that may have gone on in the past 30, 40,000 years.
If you suffer from seasonal affective disorder, moving to Tromso in the Arctic Circle doesn't seem like the best place <laughs> to live. Not a good that. idea, no. Best place to live. I, I want to ask you now some questions um, based on my own experience before we uh, sort of open it up a bit. I find I can sometimes go to bed at 9 o'clock, get to sleep, and I'll wake up and have a pee at about 11 o'clock. And I will have slept so well and deeply, it feels to me as though I've had a better sleep than I've sort of ever had before. Mm. And I, I get out and go out and, 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 and it so well and deeply, it feels to me as though I've had a better sleep than I've sort of ever had before. Mm. And I, I get out and go out and, 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 and it, I can't believe it's 11 o'clock in the evening still, I've slept so well. Yeah. The old myth is, or the old statement is, two hours before, an hour before midnight equals two hours after midnight. Any truth in that? Well, it's, it is quite interesting, because if you look at the natural sleep structure of, of peoples who don't have any exposure to electric light, they have a very different sleep pattern to us. There's, there's as dusk approaches, unless there's any specific festi festivals or anything, there's a two-hour transition of, of quiet rest. Uh, from dusk onwards. After that, it's four hours of con consolidated sleep, you know, REM, non-REM sleep. Then people wake up. They'll wander around for half an hour. They'll have another four hours of consolidated sleep and then a two-hour transition. So it's a 12-hour sleep episode. And, of course, what we have done as a society is squeeze that often into six and a half hours. And so what you may be experiencing is actually that sort of biphasic nature right. of sleep and, and that, that tendency to wake. And, of course, what happens is that individuals get terribly upset, think, oh, my goodness, I've woken up, I'm never going to get back to sleep again, and then start fretting, and they won't get back to sleep again. But actually, it could be a perfectly normal part of our sleep structure. So that, and that's m more than one society this is observed for. Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Societies that have... Yeah. No, no, no exposure to... So, to so electric electricity light. is what's made us... Is, yes, well, not uh, electricity, but candles and, um, and lanterns. Mm. Very interesting. Right, and I also wanted to talk to you about getting to sleep. I want you to uh, comment on my rituals for getting to sleep. Um, <laughs> you, you and um, so th these are not... I mean, these are, these are not unique to me, but... OK, first I put a fan on to white noise. Mm, very effective. Yes, because essentially it's, it's, it's a neutralizing, you're making a standard sensory input. Because, of course, as we're falling asleep, any slight right. sound... So of the television from the next room is really yeah. totally... Okay. And, of okay. course, you then become obsessive about it, and then you fixate on that sound, and it makes it even worse. I mean, I, I used to, when, I, when we lived in the States, the, the air conditioner, you know, throughout the July, August, this... <laughs> used to love it. C turning it off in September, I couldn't get to sleep. Get back to yeah. No, well, I, I find the fan absolutely essential. It goes on every night. Um... I put on a tape. It's basically a guy going, go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you want to admit Breathe that? Breathe <laughs> deeply. I mean, I can, I, can, I can give people names if they want. They are fantastic, <laughs> these, these things. I, I never get to the end. I mean, I'm just out. Like, it fills your head with a soft mush that just de-stimulates you in the most astonishing way. So 9 o'clock in the evening, I'm asleep by quarter past. Okay. Mm. Well, what you've got is a set of rituals that work. And in fact, a winding down regime like that is, is proved to be very successful for many individuals. It's, it's partly because it's having some physiological effect, but also it's a comfort because you associate that with falling to sleep. I mean, I, I, I read and I get about a, a page or so, and then I fall asleep. And in fact, it's, it's in front of somebody said, gosh, you must read lots of scientific papers. I said, no, 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 it's Donna Leon. It's, you know, it's anything other than, um, th than, uh, than science, because that just wakes me up. So it's, those little rituals are yeah. really important. It used to be the Radio 4 Midnight News. I never oh, got yes. to the, uh, <laughs> the closing headlines. But uh, no, now it's um, Deep Sleep Journey through self-hypnosis with Dr. Siddha Shah. Ah. Um, <laughs> I breathe consciously, slowly, and deeply. Mm -hmm. I mean, that does seem to help, doesn't it? If you yes. sort of consciously slow your breathing down. There's a relaxation down. process, yes. I also find something that helps. I'm, I'm the only person I know who does this. If I close my eyes and move them around very quickly, kind of north, south, east, west. No, I, I haven't heard that. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, hell, if it works for you. <laughs> right, right. And then the other one is thought games. If, if I don't have the tape, you can play conscious games. Yeah. Um, and clearly you don't want to overstimulate yourself by thinking of how to solve, you know, global problems, for example. Mine is, I think of something, and then I have to think of a different, you know, on a sort of a rhythm of about one or two long breaths, 
I then have to think of a different thing that has no connection to the previous one. So it's, it's like I think of a, gr a greenhouse. And then you have to think of something else that is... You can't think of a plant. That would be too close to a greenhouse. You have to think of lines of latitude would be the next one. You know, and it just has to be something completely unrelated. And again, I find that... It's sort of like counting sheep. It just knocks me... I'm amazed you get any sleep at all. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, maybe a good... Uh, this is a good point for you to tell us... Uh, I mean, there is enough research in this area, isn't there, to sort of talk about sleep hygiene, of what, yeah. what are good habits and bad habits. Because there's one thing I haven't mentioned here, which I know you will come on to, which is the half bottle of wine <laughs> that, <laughs> that um, you sometimes have with dinner beforehand. But no, go, go, well, go ahead. I mean, we talk us through the, the sleep hygiene I, I tips, will, because, because I think this is these, the these are useful tips. Um, so... These are the sorts of things that one should ideally do and not do. So try and have a consolidated um, uh, bedtime and, and rise time each day. Try and get that as stable as possible. Get regular exercise in the day, preferably in the morning. And, get, and, and that's important because what you don't want to do is drive up core body temperature late at night. And we'll come on to that in, in a moment. You don't want to increase core body temperature late at night. Exercise, uh, sorry, get regular exposure to out, outdoor bright light in the morning. Now, morning light is very effective at setting our body clock to local time. So if you're going to get out and get a good dose of light exposure, then, then do it in the morning. One of the great problems in the nursing home environment is that many individuals in that environment get less than two minutes of natural light each day. And that isn't strong enough, it's not a robust enough signal to lock the clock onto local time. It's very really important to appreciate that the light that you will normally live under in, in an office or, or, a, um, or, or in the factory, uh, shortly, after, shortly after dawn, natural light is some um, 50 to 100 times brighter than average office lighting or home lighting conditions. And by noon, it's 500 to 1,000 times brighter. And we're not good at assessing that huge difference. Many of us live in dim, dark caves. And that morning light exposure can be, be really important. Keep the bedroom slightly cool. And this goes back to, to exercising in the morning rather than the evening. There's a, there's a drop in core body temperature which seems to be very important to allow sleep initiation. And there are individuals who have conditions called vasospastic disorder, which means that their vasculature in their hands and feet can't dilate, they're constricted, which means you can't shunt blood from the core to the periphery and therefore lose that heat. And those individuals who have a vascular problem also have a sleep problem. So don't overheat the bedroom. Keep it, obviously you don't want to be cold, but you don't want to be overheated. And, you know, um, so what else? Keep, obviously very um, uh, 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 um, uh, quiet um, for the reasons we were discussing. Dark. Even relatively low amounts of light in... in, in, in um, when you're trying to get to sleep, are a problem. And, and this, is, this relates to the problems of computer screens and televisions in bedrooms. It's not bright enough to shift the clock, but it will increase levels of arousal and therefore decrease your chances of going to sleep. So televisions, all that sort of stuff, <coughs> ideally off. It's, just, it's not just the TVs, is it? It's the... Um, everything in our bedroom seems to have a little orange yeah. light on it or a red light well, and it's just unbelievable we've had to stick bits of blue tack on them and yes. tape Perso yes. to turn these yeah. dark things off dark dark cool um keeping your uh, feet and hands warm this this i mean this is something your grandparents probably told you to do but it relates again to this peripheral vasodilation if your hands and feet are warm it means that you will have uh, you can shunt blood from the core to the periphery so kind of obvious stuff don't watch television or computer games don't have caffeine in the evening. And in fact, a, a, a cup of coffee um, shortly after midday for some people who are sensitive will significantly delay bedtime. Don't use alcohol, as, as we've discussed. Don't go to bed too hungry or too full. Don't take other people's sleeping tablets. <laughs> don't, don't take over-the-counter sleeping pills. This is really good. If you ever have a, have a few hours in the afternoon Go and stand at the, at the uh, pharmaceutical counter in Boots and just, just watch the people. And, and, they'll, um, and they'll say, can I have some um, antihistamines, please? And the very nice individual behind the counter said, would that be drowsy or non-drowsy? I said, no, no, give me the drowsy ones. 
because many people are self-medicating on antihistamines. Histamine is one of those neurotransmitters we talked about that helps the cortex, keep, helps the brain keep awake. Using an antihistamine that is drowsy is used by a lot of people to self-medicate. Don't take napping. Napping, very important. Um, a nap in the middle of the afternoon will delay the time at which you want to go to sleep because it affects that homeostat, that driver. So don't, lap, don't nap longer than 30 minutes. And then, again, don't get overexcited. Don't try and, and command yourself to go to sleep. Use those, those working down um, uh, exercises that Evan was, was, was talking about. OK, sleep hygiene, good habits. I mean, it's amazing that we don't talk about these more, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, it's such a big part of our lives. And, um well, I think what's so extraordinary, in, in a five- or six-year training of a medical student, they may have one or two lectures on sleep. Not at Oxford, of course, we give them a lot of sleep. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and one of those lectures will be on the nature of the EEG, which, of course, is you know, all these electrodes and lots of squiggles. We still haven't any bloody idea what the EEG actually tells us, and yet they'll learn all that, but they won't do that. Right. I'm sure some of you have experiences you want to share, or... Um, questions you want to ask Russell, uh, if you put your hands up, and um, I can't see the microphone, folks. We've got a couple up there at the back, so we'll, we'll take them along that, um, that next to the aisle there, and then we'll move over towards that block there. Yeah. Oh, hello. Um, I find that I do, I do go to bed about 10, half 10, every evening, and I always read a book. Yep. I read a book to the point where it will... I'll drop it sometimes, I'll fall asleep. But by the time I've turned over, put the book down, switch the light off, I'm wide awake again. <laughs> yes. Now, I know someone else who has that, uh, that issue. Yeah, what, is it good to drift off without sort of properly... Well, I suppose the light is still on. That's part of the problem. That's Do you keep the light... Is the light still on when you put the book away? I, I guess it's got to be if they were reading yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because actually, you... you yeah, what do you do about that? Well, it's, it's a, I mean, in a sense, you have to... What I, what I do, because I actually am I'm fortunate enough to have a, 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 a partner who's a morning type. So, again, I'm, I'm hoping... Well, we've got to 26 years, so it's not bad. Um, but, 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 but Lizzie's very sensitive to light. She's a, she, she likes to go to bed early. But for Christmas, she gave me this tiny little torch. Right. <laughs> so I'm sort of there reading my Donna Leon or something. Um, so it's very dim light. And, and actually, uh, joking aside, it, you know, it, it works quite well, because I'm then... I've got a little switch on the bottom or something. Um, so it's very dim light. And, and actually, uh, joking aside, it, you know, it, it works quite well because I'm then, I've got a little switch on the bottom which I turn off, put it on the side, and it's not all these actions of, of reaching out, turning a bright light off and a big change. So I use a little, a little dim torch. Sorry. I, do, I do have one of those. Does it, yeah. does it help? Yeah. Do, do you well, find it helps? Well, it's okay. I nod off, but as soon as I turn over or stop reading, then somebody switches the light on in my head. I'm wide awake again. Yeah. Yeah. So in a way, you've got to stop yourself reading before you fall asleep. So you can, you can turn the light off, put the book down. And, and I think that's a very good point, because essentially you learn at what phase it will be smart to actually yeah. try sleep at this point, rather than fall asleep and then, and then wake, wake yourself up. up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very good. Right, we had a couple alongside the aisle there, just next to uh, there, and then we'll go over to this half here, haven't we? A couple of years ago, travelling to the States, I tried taking melatonin, oh, yes. which I'd bought at a chemist in, in Holland, um, and I think it, it uh, reduced the, the jet lag significantly, but my yeah. local GP here advised me against doing it. What's your opinion? Well, That's a very good question. That's actually yeah. on my list of questions, <laughs> that one, because everybody says it is yeah. better than a sort of sleeping pill. Melatonin is, and the, and, and the military have got really quite interested in melatonin because you can, in about 70% of people, melatonin will have a direct sleep inductive effect. It will actually lower your, your, your sort of feelings of wakeness and actually allow you to slide uh, off, into, off into sleep sort of more easily. And, and people without jet lag and all the rest of it will take, you know, melatonin at 10 or 11 p.m. because they've gone to Amsterdam or War of the States and they bought it over the counter. Um, so the evidence seems to suggest that in 70% of people it can have a slight, slight sleep inductive effect. It can probably also, as we discussed earlier, mimic darkness. And so with morning light and evening melatonin, you can speed up the rate at which the clock 
will lock on to the local light-dark cycle. So, so, so the, the evidence is reasonably good for taking melatonin for jet lag. The problem we have with melatonin is that we're not really sure of its mechanisms of action. And furthermore, um, we don't know what the long-term use of melatonin is. So one is then taking a drug. I can understand the reservation of your GP because we don't know what the mechanism of action is and we don't know what long-term use will be. My guess, and I am not clinically qualified, would be that an acute once or twice, you know, two or three times every month or something, it's, it's not a problem. Sustained use of melatonin or, frankly, any other drug, um, I, I will begin to become concerned. And it, and it flips to the other sorts of drugs. I mean, some of you may have heard of a drug called Provigil or Modafinil. It's, it's one of those new generation, although it's been around for 15 years, ways of staying on task and acutely overriding the need for sleep. And it's shown to be very effective. Um, Provigil was used by the troops in the first uh, Gulf War and probably the second Gulf War, particularly the pilots, because the alternative was amphetamine. And of course, coming down from amphetamine caused real problems. Many instances of friendly fire were associated with coming down on, on, on amphetamine. Again, Probably the acute use of these drugs, no problem. But the brain is this extraordinary structure. If you give it a sustained sort of input of anything, it realigns itself. And the great terror, I think, with some of these drugs is the brain then becomes dependent upon things like modafinil or provigil for its normal cognitive function. So acutely, probably fine. Sustained, I would avoid it, as your, as your GP um, suggested. Can you still buy it here? I thought they took it off the... the you, you you, but there was a point where you could get it, couldn't you? Yeah. Have to you go basically, to many, many countries, uh, the states particularly, uh, were... I mean, the problem is there was a book that came out a few years ago, and it was called The Melatonin Miracle. Absolutely ghastly, completely <laughs> fraudulent book. Um, and is this being videoed? Oh, well, that's it. Um, <clears throat> and the, one of the problems is it was based on, on an experiment whereby the pineal, which produces the melatonin, was transplanted into mice that didn't have a pineal, and they looked at longevity and all the rest of it. And they said, ah, with the pineal, these, these, these mice live longer. So melatonin is this wonder drug. Trouble is, they'd used a genetic strain of mouse which doesn't produce any melatonin. I mean, the whole data was complete nonsense. Um, so, so there's some snake oil still lurking around, so you have to be a bit careful. But, but melatonin is not available um, unless by prescription in this country, and I think that's a very smart idea. Right, right. OK, we'll take the gentleman behind, and then we'll go over to that side there. But there was a gentleman just three up from the last gentleman who uh, spoke to us with a hand up. Yeah, just doing that. Actually, yeah, we've got a couple there, yeah. Why is it that some people require more sleep than others? I, I, I was hoping somebody would ask that, because the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's related to that homeostat, that, that, um, that, you know, the longer you've been awake, the greater the sleep pressure. Now, we're beginning to understand those mechanisms. And one of the substances is called adenosine. Now, the as the metabolic currency in the brain, of course, is ATP, and in cells is ATP, ATP is broken down during metabolism and converted into adenosine. So adenosine is a measure of metabolic activity. And adenosine levels do rise throughout the day. And it seems that adenosine buildup in the prefrontal cortex, this bit here, um, increases the sleep pressure and the drive for sleep. And I suspect that sleep duration, why some people need a long um, and others a, a short, are related to the response to the build-up of adenosine in the brain. We don't actually know, but that would be my prediction on the basis of the science we have so far. But is there a, is there a cost, you know, um, to the people who don't need much sleep and don't get much sleep because they don't feel like it, yeah. do we know whether that is good for them or whether they would be better if they had more sleep? Uh, there's, a, there's a really very interesting set of dynamics here. First of all, there is a lot of individual variability. But if you ask people how much sleep they need, they're very bad at giving you a, an accurate answer. Classic one is in cab drivers. Any cab drivers in the audience? Hands up. That's a relief. Um, so um, so th they'll, they'll say, oh, I've worked on the night shift for, for years, and it's fine. It's never had any effect on me. Actually, cab drivers be, have been brought into the lab, and their cognitive abilities have been assessed. And they're deeply impaired. And it goes back to this, this real problem in that, that you think you're fine, and you're not. I mean, if you take nothing else from this presentation, the fact that your ability to drive a car between 4 and 6 a.m. is as bad as if you consumed sufficient alcohol to make you legally drunk. 
in terms of your ability to perform cognitive tasks. So it's really, really, and you don't know it. You think you're fine. So what were those hours? Between 4 and 6 a.m. in most people. And though, that is when the Today programme is put together. And, that and, is and, they, and do you drive to work, do you? No, we don't. There you go. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> it is absolutely amazing. Okay, we'll take one last one from that little corner there, just because it's very, it's very easy, and then I promise we'll move over there. Yeah, th- uh, thank you. Um, thanks, Russell. Um, just got some thoughts about. Can you uh, wave? I can't see you. Um, he's, he's over there. I just got yeah. some thoughts about what you were saying about uh, the Inuit. Of, uh, yes. of I've been up in Inuit country. What sets it apart, to my mind, is there's no uh, electric lights. Yeah. Um, they're living on natural light, and Tromso is is um, lit up like Blackpool. Yeah. <laughs> the other observation: I work on a hospital ward. For the last year, we've secretly uh, been switching the coffee. To decaffeinated at seven o'clock, <laughs> and the difference it's made is fantastic. And explain to us what's you, going on. Hang on, yeah. you were feeding people coffee at bedtime. It's it's disgraceful, Evan. I mean, <laughs> but but they probably also give them sleeping tablets, right? They, 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 quite often they actually dispense sleeping tablets to routine patients in hospitals. Um, no, I it's think horrendous. I'm sure, I had to spend. But my main time. question is: it's probably a small sample size. But Russell, do you think? Radio 4 presenters, there's a small cluster of them, and regularly people like, well, Ed Sturton never does it, he's got good concentration, but John Humphreys and others regularly frightens the British population by giving a rubbish time check. <laughs> <laughs> and God bless yeah, yeah, them. Absolutely. But, ah. they, but the, the real national question is, if you were to switch Paxman to a morning shift, would you be less grouchy? <laughs> thank you for that, uh, well, thank you for that yes, question. Lots of interesting... I mean, we, Evan and I were talking bef- before we, we started, and, and we thought that what we should do is, is look for the number of fluffs you know, the mistakes that the presenters make in the Today programme versus something world at around about noon. Yeah, yeah, the world at one. And, and actually to chronotype the Today uh, programme presenters and look at the frequency of mistakes. And we have our suspicions that at least one of them um, who <laughs> is inclined, who, should, who makes quite a few mistakes, is probably a late person. Right. Um, we're going to go over to that side. We've got loads there. So uh, sort of up that side, we've got several people. I can, see, I can just see a red... Over, uh, Back, back over to the, le- the edge, there's someone with a red top, I'm sorry, the light stopped. Yes, hello. There's a new app you can download for your iPod that apparently if you put it under your pillow, it will yes. um, wake you at the nearest time to what you're meant to wake up at. Is uh, that scientifically credible? Well, what's interesting, I haven't tried it, um, but what I, as I understand it, under normal circumstances, you're not woken up, obviously, by an alarm clock. You go through a series of REM and non, or non-REM and REM cycles. REM um, sleep is where you see the eyes moving, rapid eye movement sleep. And ideally, you have deep sleep during the first half of the night, which actually relates to your question right. about the morning versus afternoon, uh, um, first five, versus Before second. Before and after midnight. Yeah. And then you have more REM sleep uh, during the second half of the sleep phase. And ideally, you wake naturally from, from REM. And in fact, if you do, there's, more, there's a greater chance of you remembering your dreams because more complex, vivid dreams tend to occur in REM sleep rather than non-REM sleep. Now, I don't know how the device works, but as I understand it, it can detect, presumably by muscle tone, because during REM sleep, you're basically paralyzed. Um, and it can probably detect that sort of level of muscle tone and then um, say, right, this is, this is towards the morning, this is the last episode of REM, I'll wake him up now. And, and that will be the logic. Um, and it sort of kind of makes sense, but I don't know if it's been looked at um, objectively uh, in terms of uh, feelings of sleep, sleep quality and all the rest of it. Unfortunately, most of us don't have the luxury. You know, we basically have to get up at seven or whatever it is, and the alarm clock drives it. Have you, tri- have you tried it? Have you... No, I was going to get one because people say it's wonderful, but I, it sounded a bit bogus to me. Well, it sounded it does, th- th- there's, there's some science it. behind it, but, but to my knowledge, nobody's actually looked at whether it makes a difference. Um, and so, I, 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 yeah, I mean, it depends on how much it is. It'd be worth an experiment if it's a few quid, but I wouldn't invest a great deal of money in it. Um, God, I mean, that is, but that is an extraordinary thought that yeah. you could sort of, yeah, use that information about the movement of the body to detect a thing like that. Yeah, And certainly one's ability to wake up and, and make 
you know, cognitive decisions is yeah. better from REM than, than, than slow wave sleep. I mean, if you were right down in the, in the depths of slow wave sleep, stage three, stage four, the alarm clock goes off and you will feel much groggier than REM sleep. So I can understand at that level it would make sense, yes. I'm sure quite a few people here will have had something I've felt, which is you wake up a minute before the alarm clock is going to wake you. What's going on there? I'm sure quite a few people here will have had something I've felt, which is you wake up a minute before the alarm clock is going to wake you. What's going on there? Is that just because our body clock is incredibly accurate, yeah, or is well, that just coincidence? That's really intriguing. And um, if I might talk about bees for a moment. Um, flowers open their petals and their nectaries at very specific times of the day. And a bee will actually use its internal clock as an event manager. It, the, the forager bees will go out, they'll say, that bunch of flowers over there um, at that time will have lots of nectar in the nectaries, it'll then communicate that and all its mates will go out and then visit that particular flower at that particular time of the day. And it's using its, its 24 hour clock as an event calendar. Now, it's likely that we are doing a similar sort of thing, although, again, it's much talked about, but there are very few studies that, that actually have, have, have said that we're behaving like bees. But I think it's highly likely. Quite possible we'd yeah. have a, a bit of bee, bee in us. OK, bee up that side, yeah. I can see some more just up there, just where you were, or, or up the, yeah, OK, up the aisle, either way. Um, I was wondering whether you have ever done the questionnaire in... Um, summer and winter, whether you'd have a different oh. replies to yes. people if you'd done it during the literature festival in October. <laughs> no, th and also, related to that, the sort of thing of conditioning that, I mean, I've just retired and I don't really want to wake up at 7.30 and I don't put my alarm off and I can't stop doing it. And I have a, a friend who was a definitely a night person but then she had a child and now the child's gone to university, she can't sleep beyond you know, the time he used to go to school for 18 years. Yeah. So all this thing about conditioning around it versus your actual clock. Yeah. Okay, so, so if we take the age thing first, the, 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 we, we talked about that blip from 10 to 20, and then this, this, this tendency to go to, want to get, get up uh, and go to bed earlier and earlier and earlier. By the time you're um, in your 60s, you're really, the, the getting up and going to bed at, at quite an early phase. So the time you've got the kids gone, out, out and off to university, you're probably in your 50s, 55, and so your sleep timing will have changed. This tendency to want to go to bed earlier and get up earlier. So, so that's, that's probably nothing to do with conditioning. Now, the, sorry, the second part of the question, I've forgotten, what, what was that? One was to do with the fact that you've woken up for years a certain time yeah. with your alarm and you stop it, but also the other one was to do with longitude and latitude, that if you'd oh, asked yeah. us in yeah. the yeah, winter no, or if you asked Swedish people or Italian no. people whether you'd get different concepts of early and late people. No, that's a very good question. And in fact, we've got a study going at the moment. Um, what's extraordinary is that, that when, you, when you survey university students, they tend to be moderately evening to evening types in the UK. And, I, and I'm lucky enough to go and visit um, University of Western Australia for a few weeks every year, and I teach out there. And I got them to do this survey, and they weren't late. They were right, absolutely right uh, in the middle. Um, they weren't showing this late shift. And we think it's because of light levels. And of course, light levels will change enormously as the seasons expand and contract. And so you're absolutely right. Your, your tendency to change your sleep pattern through the seasons will change, almost certainly. And it'll be due to the light levels. Do you have a view on the clock? The, 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 you know, there's a debate about whether we should move on to a, an hour ahead, on to continental time, which yeah, would, yeah. Be an, would give us slightly darker mornings and lighter evenings. The, the data there are really quite interesting, and it's from the University of Loughborough. And they've looked at the accident rate on uh, road traffic accidents on the transition when we lose an hour and you get a blip in the accident rate, which is significant. And the argument is that we're such a sleep-deprived society these days. Even a change of one hour really takes us into the danger zone, and, there's, and then it makes us sleepier, the alarm goes off, and you're really not firing on, on, on all cylinders by the time you get into the car. The difficulty with the data is, is that when you gain an hour, there's also a blip in the accident rate. So you think, well, <laughs> you know, it makes no sense. The way the Loughborough people get round it is say, well, obviously, it's because everything's, whoa, I've got an extra hour in bed, let's really party tonight. <laughs> and then, then become excessively tired. And you know, it relates to your sleep hygiene. They've actually disrupted their, their standard bedtimes. 
So, yeah, but right. so what's my advice? I don't think we should change. I, I, don't, I think we should just stick to it. And, and I, I know it's for, for, lo, for, for the Scottish and the farmers' yeah. uh, population, but I'm afraid that you just, just take it on the chin. Um. Um, okay, more questions from over there, and then we'll take a couple from here, and we'll, then we're going to wrap up. We haven't got very long now, so, yeah. Uh, two questions, I guess, uh, but I think related. Do we need REM sleep for someone that usually wakes up after about four hours? You talked about this, getting up for a half an hour and going back to sleep again. Do we need to do that, or can we just get up and carry on with life for the day? Right. The it, second thing is, uh, how do you think Southern Europe has coped with siestas? Ah, oh, yes, okay. very good point. Given your 30 good point. limit on afternoon sleep. Yeah. Yes, yeah, some really good questions. So, so I sort of was being a bit naughty earlier and saying, you know, EEG, you know, sort of everybody measures and talks about EEG, and we don't really have much idea about what actually is going on. It used to be thought that REM sleep was really the most important part of sleep. And if you didn't get REM, you wouldn't have memory consolidation, you wouldn't have a whole bunch of other things. And the arguments were, well, that's when you have your most vivid dreams, and therefore that must be the most important thing for the brain. The evidence now seems to be that slow-wave sleep, stage 3, stage 4, might actually be more important than REM sleep. The difficulty is, is, is what you've exposed here is, why do we sleep? And what do the different sleep stages represent? And I think it's one of the great biological questions that remain unanswered. And, 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 uh, and, 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 and it's something that we've moved into fairly recently. And I have to say we've got some exciting data on that. But no, that's, a, that's an extremely good point. So you, for you specifically, yes, I think if you acutely sleep-deprive rats, for example, of REM sleep, they will show cognitive defi deficits. So I, wouldn't, I don't think you can exclude it entirely, but whether REM is more important than slow-wave sleep, I think the jury is still out on that one. And there was a second question. Sorry, what was that? Uh, Siestas. Siestas. Yes, it was very interesting. Um, when I visited Spain oh, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, many of the, the industrial plants, the car plants, were being taken over by, by German companies, and they were banning the siesta. And that was having a big impact uh, upon the workforce and, and, and the change in their sort of social, social habits. I mean, what the siesta does, of course, is that it takes you out of the, the, the primary heat of the day. And in the past, that was probably rather important. But, the, but as I said, the consequences of taking a siesta is that it pulls back the sleep pressure, the homeostatic drive, which means you will go to sleep later in the evening. And that's exactly what happens. You have um, a siesta and then food and sleep is delayed way into the, the early hours of the morning. At least it was traditionally in Spain. It's partly cultural, but it has, um, but it has a sort of an origin in the fact that people couldn't really function in the heat of the, uh, of, of the middle of the day. I think they're drinking fewer spirits, actually, because they were drinking spirits very That's late true. and they were going to very bed very late and they're going to bed earlier and having... Um, yeah. a, 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 right, I think we'll take just one, one more question and then we really have to go. We'll take it from the middle block somewhere. The gentleman right... Put your hands up again, middle block, someone in this middle block here, who, gentleman right there at the back with his... Yeah, there's a guy in the blue shirt ne next to the microphone person. Yeah, here, that's it, that's it, got it. Sorry, you've already touched on this. All animals are very vulnerable when they're asleep. Why do we do such a dangerous thing? Oh. Well, I'll have to send you a, a paper I've just been working on, because... So, it, you, you, again, you've come back to the business of, of why do we sleep. And essentially, most organisms have a rest activity cycle. Whether you're a bacteria or a human, you have a rest activity cycle. And, but the brain and other bodily functions have a whole bunch of housekeeping roles. You know, you either have memory consolidation or you have cell division. And I think the decision of where do you allocate those, those housekeeping functions to a rest activity cycle. So the first question is, why do we have a rest activity cycle? And what that represents is a compromise between the amount of activity that we need to, to squeeze into the day to get food, to get sexual partners, to do all the other sorts of things we need to thrive, and perhaps to avoid predation, um, because the assumption is that while you're asleep, you're more vulnerable to predation. The evidence is not absolutely clear on that one. But another idea that surfaced is that maybe and it goes back to some discussions we had about the Red Queen, is that 
it's exposure to pathogens. The more you move through the environment, the greater your statistical chance of actually encountering some sort of pathogen or some sort of infection. And so maybe the sleep-wake cycle is this compromise between what you've got to do and to limit your exposure to danger. And then sleep, which is, which is usually associated with brain repair, it's really, that's, that's not the right way to think about it. It's a housekeeping function which happens to be allocated to a certain part of the rest activity cycle. And that's about as I, all the time we've got to, to explain the reasons for sleep. But, but, but we can talk about it later, maybe. Yeah. Mm. How is your sleep? What's, what's your habit? I'm horribly late. Very late. Look at me, of course. It's, you know, <laughs> uh, you know not getting enough sleep. Terrible ghrelin levels. Eat carbohydrates, you know, early hours of the morning. And for people who've got kids, basically send them to bed earlier than you're probably sending them to, is the take home. Yes. Right. Send them to bed. There's really <laughs> so much to be said about it. If any of you nodded off during that, <laughs> appalling, because it was so interesting. Well, it was nothing to do with us, because it's the level of arousal. Yeah, Dim light, is. you're more likely to fall asleep. The fans actually do have the effect of slightly numbing the atmosphere, but Russell, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Cheers, Evan. Well, what a fascinating... <laughs> What, uh, what an absolutely fascinating session, and um, uh, thank you very much to, uh, to Russell and to Evan. So those of us who've been part of the organization of the festival and have been here for the last five days, my sleep patterns have, have gone back to my youth, so I'm going to bed at 12 or 1 and getting up at about 8. And I feel so much better. I feel younger already. <laughs> but Jill, has that anything to do with the alcohol? Do you think you're alcohol? <laughs> Well, uh, yes, recreational substances were involved, and that's the only one, yes. So I think that was a, a fabulous end to this, or almost end to this festival. And uh, I'd like to, in addition to, to thanking our two speakers, thank the whole team who've made this, uh, this festival so wonderful this, this year. And... Um, And in a strange sort of way, you know, everybody here in the audience is actually part of that team because it's you that make the festival so great. We always say to people who we invite here, we're going to show you what the Cheltenham audience can do. So we are yours, but you're ours because you're our secret weapon. So thank you very much for coming this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it very much. And I'd like to finish off. Uh, two things, to thank once again Oxford Biomedical Research Centre, but to tell you that Russell will be signing books in the bookshop. Over to you, mes amis. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you.